Welcome to episode six of After Hours with Alex and Anthony. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. Um, we're really uh, happy to have you here, and uh, hopefully we have a good topic for you tonight. I certainly think it's going to be interesting. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning and sort of at what point do the robots take over. We kind of started a little bit into it last night talking about data and, and things of that nature. Um, but tonight we're really going to kind of dive in and, and talk a little bit more in depth about where machine learning and artificial intelligence has gone, um, you know, what role it plays in a lot of different industries, and, and in some ways what role it plays uh, in our lives. Before we get to that, though, there are a couple little sort of housekeeping notes. Um, you'll notice that tonight we started by sharing it onto our page and then onto our personal, um, our personal feeds. So from now on, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be putting it onto our Facebook page. So we'd greatly appreciate it if you share that out um, or, you know, share it with your friends or whatever, because uh, we're going to be going live from there from now on. Uh, the second thing is we now have spread out a little bit and took an hour or so tonight um, and put together a, a YouTube channel, a SoundCloud page, a podcast page, and the website. Um, where you can go sign up, add your email, uh, and get notifications as to when we're going live um, so you can stay up to date with us. Awesome enough, the domain that we got for this is liveafterhours.com. So liveafterhours.com. Um, really simple page. Hopefully it can direct you to the, uh, the information we need, and, and you can sign up there. So without further ado... Uh, let's uh, let's dive on into it. You ready for this? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. But I just I want to make a quick note on what you said there. And it was kind of ridiculous because we did spend about an hour, hour and a half doing all of those things. And obviously the website was very simple, but it's kind of crazy that we we did uh, put the website together, get, you know, the, the downloads for the YouTube videos and, and the podcast together and everything kind of together all within about an hour and a half. Um, so, you know, kudos to us for getting that done so quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, it kind of goes right into, you know, our topic tonight, which is obviously artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. Um, and it's kind of amazing to think we were able to do it because we knew exactly what to do. We've done this before. It's not our first time. Um, but it'll be interesting to see there's going to be companies coming out that with a click of a button, you'll be able to do all of these things as long as your accounts are connected to it. Uh, and it'll be really cool to see people, you know, launching tons of stuff uh, very, very quickly. Um, so artificial intelligence, uh, we touched on it a little bit yesterday when we were talking about marketing and, and, um, and how people are using it. And I discussed that I'm using it, you know, my AIM open house page uh, for my Facebook bots and, and how we're kind of using artificial intelligence to, to get customer service questions answered and whatnot. Um, but that's just a small part of artificial intelligence, right? So there are so many broad aspects of artificial intelligence. So where do you, where do you kind of want to start this? Where, what do you want to talk about first? <laughs> well, let's, I think first is let's give people an idea of what we mean by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, because it, it's not necessarily an everyday topic um, or right. not something that, you know, we necessarily, even you or I, deal with every day. So, you know, let's kind of talk about that. Um, I think one of the best ways to think about it and to think about machine learning and artificial intelligence is that it goes beyond the point where it's just a human coding a machine to do either repetitive right. or some sort of program task. It gets to the point where you're teaching a machine how to learn as opposed to teaching a machine how to do something, right? You're, it's it's right. a teach a man to fish, right? Or give the man the fish almost kind of a right. thing. Right. In this case, you're, you're getting to the point where you're, you're teaching machines to, uh, to learn. And then the real differentiator when you start getting to artificial intelligence is the notion that you can't tell a human being can't tell the difference between a human and the machine that right. is that you know you could have a conversation with this machine for two or three hours without once thinking in your head like boy is that a machine responding to me um, right. that's sort of the, the notion of artificial intelligence and and where you know where things are going at that point. yeah and, so, and I think we've also seen it come you know in so many directions right where we kind of think of artificial intelligence as you know computerized and obviously you know learning learning for itself but you know, it, let's take it back to kind of where it started, right? Where customer service 10 years ago and as an industry was you called up your credit card company or, you know, wherever it might be, right? And a 
physical person answer the phone, right? Now it's come to a point where you have to go through this whole huge menu to get to the right person, it's rather to the right department, so that that person can actually help you at the end of the day. Right. When do you think that that person almost becomes unnecessary, where you can basically get anything handled, and it's as if you're having a conversation, right? It's, it's not pressing one for this, two for that, three for that. It's, you know, hi, I'm Alex, I have this problem, um, and I need help with it. And they say, okay, here's the solution. Like when, how far do we have to go to get there? Or, or are we already there and and people just haven't, I guess, haven't made the, the switch to it yet? I think we're on the cusp of being there. And I think the real delineator um, is going to be when, I mean, frankly, it comes down to service. Right. I think if I can call in, and talk to a machine and end up getting my question answered quicker than right. then you're gonna do you that know, every day right it's sort of like the um i mean we were even talking about the whole you know self-service checkout things at the supermarket you right know, a lot of people went well you know who wants to check out their own stuff but right. at the end of the day i find myself doing it because i look over i'm like well do i want to spend five minutes in line dealing with a person and you know, everything that goes along with that, or do I just want to run through with these couple items? Um, right. And there are situations where maybe I have, uh, you know, a lot of groceries, it makes more sense to go through the, the longer line with a person than just a few things to go through a quicker one. But I think really that delineator is the, when it's better service. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. Like if, I, if I'm getting, you know, three or four things at the supermarket, I'm in that self check checkout line no, no matter what. But, you know, I was on a, I did a food shop yesterday and I had a whole cart full of stuff. I went, I went right to the person. I was like, I'm not scanning every single one of these and then putting it in a bag. Right. Um, but, let me ask you, but let me ask you this. Right. If there was a machine that took all the items out of your cart and put them into bags for you. And you didn't have to deal with the like putting it onto that shelf and then the other shelf right. and the. At, would you do would you go through that line with a person uh no i probably wouldn't do the person because it's just it's just easier right you're you're in and out it's all streamlined right when, when it gets to that point it's totally streamlined and it's easy right you just scan away it does it does everything that you want to get done um and you don't have to worry about anything it's, it's it knows what it's doing all the time you're not worried about you know putting the credit card at the right time or talking to the person or this and that it's it's just easy um, and that's, 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 I think, where artificial intelligent, intelligence makes a difference is making things easier for people. Right. Now, let's think about this for a minute, because for as much as we love to believe we're ahead on things, Japan, for going on almost 10 years now, it's like seven or eight years, um, there are plenty of grocery stores in Japan where the actual products are not on the shelves. What do you mean? It's a, pic it's a picture of the product and a barcode. And okay. You walk around, and you walk around the store with a little device, and when you get to one that you want, you go, boop, and walk to the next one. And go, really? boop, walk to the next one. And when you get to the checkout, you go to checkout, you put your goods through, and there's someone waiting outside with your bags ready to go. Wow. And you don't even you, you don't even need nothing into your cart. There are no carts. There are no that now there are some items like produce or things like that where they've had they had some pushback and they had to change things up a little bit. Um, yeah, I can see that. I can see the fresh food part of it, right? Like where you you know, you want to pick your apple and you want to pick your lettuce and stuff like that. I, I definitely sure. see that, but but the you know, the box items, the cereals, the you know, pasta, all that kind of stuff. You just pick the box up and you throw it in your cart anyway. Um, so exactly. that would make things so easy. It's, it's interesting that they they do that there. I, I had no idea. And actually, interestingly enough, there were a lot of the stores that didn't even end up going um, to uh, actual like produce aisles. And hmm. when and when they asked people, do you know why a lot of them didn't care? Why? Because getting terrible produce wasn't a problem right right almost every mm -hmm. apple in the bag for them was like well they're all good apples so right why would i care to pick out my own apples today right right uh, that sort of a thing so this sort of moves away from the topic of machine learning and ai but 
this whole notion of like the even the checkout line thing that we're talking about here is really an eight or ten year old idea in other right. places, and that's why when I'm saying like we we're on the cusp, we might not be on the cusp in certain areas here, but they're really on the cusp of uh, some of this stuff. Um, interesting. In other Very interesting. Um, so where, why are we so behind? Let me ask you that first. Why are we so behind? Why aren't we? on the cutting edge of it. I mean, you know, we're um, the good old U S of a, why are not we? So there are a few reasons actually. Um, one of them is hardware. So, okay. uh, for example, like with mobile phones, um, like well, let's just say Japan versus U S as a comparison. Uh, okay. Japan has, uh, different standards for and lower standards for radioactive emissions from their phones. Okay. So, they're actually able to put out hardware to the consumers four to five years before what we are in the U.S. just by radioactive emission standards. Great. Great. So. Although, <laughs> they have bigger worries in terms of radioactive emission standards. So. Yeah. You know, it just, it makes you, it makes you wonder. I mean, I, listen, I appreciate the standards, right? Like. Don't give me any extra radiation that I don't need. But how above those levels are they? And, and how stri like how small are our levels that it takes four to five years to get there where they can release so, products to us? They're reasonably minimal differences, but they can make a difference. Last I okay. checked, it was like, and I forget what the exact, like, if it's like parts per million or parts per mm -hmm. whatever, but there's a certain whatever code. Of it. it was something right. like, our standards were 0 0.08 and theirs were 0 0.1. Okay, so it's very minimal. Uh, reasonably minimal in terms of the, the differences between the two, but a pretty big, you know, differentiator in terms of being able to cut it down from one to the other. Like, right. for example, one, one of the, the technologies that's actually being held up because of that specifically right now is um, – battery charging via FM radio wave. Interesting. I can't wait for that. So, I've been I've seen articles about that. I can't wait to like walk in walk everywhere and just have my phone charging. <laughs> charging. Yeah. Um but that's one of them because, you know, they're it's the the devices that they would need to do it and are doing it at this point are um bad enough in terms of that they can't quite bring them to the US, but we're right. you know, um, but the interesting thing is when when you move from hardware to software, that's where there's a big difference in terms of that. Right. Like we're head on software in a lot of different ways um, in terms of the products. Because a lot of them are developed here. Well, right. companies are housed here that pay people all over the world to develop them, but um, right. originated here, we'll say that. Right. The idea came from here. It might not be, quote unquote, built here, but it was designed and, and whatever, and maybe even packaged here. Um, but it's, right. it's not necessarily, <laughs> quote unquote, American made. Um, yeah. Interesting. So, all right. So let's talk about the, the software side of this a little bit. So okay. obviously there's a ton of software out there, right? And, and to our topic yesterday where, you know, software is taking jobs from people, you know, hand over fist in, in a lot of industries like uh, for instance, you know, I think of the McDonald's, um, you know, cashiers there, right? Like you can't, you can't automate the fry cook. You can't automate the burger. To, and listen, I'm sure you can, but I don't know if you would. Um, but the cashier part, right? You know, we're starting to see more and more McDonald's and, and all of these, you know, Wendy's um, to these self-service kiosks for people where they can do what they want. They type in exactly what they want and it's eliminating those cashiers, right? So why, why is the driving of that? so slow, right? Because for me as a consumer, and for you as a consumer, I'm sure, I would much rather type exact or, you know, press the buttons or the pictures, whatever, really quickly, know it's right when I put it in the computer, and then hope it's right when I get it, right? Instead of that extra middleman. It's not about eliminating the job for me, it's it's about the convenience of it. Do you know, do you want to know the sad part and the sad answer to this? Yeah. Human robots, are cheaper than machine robots. Hmm. Interesting. I can pay a few, and, and I don't mean that, I'm not knocking people that work there. What I mean is the, the essence of what they've done, what a McDonald's has done, 
is they have systemized everything. Right. right? Literally and down to how much ketchup goes on the burger, like everything. Everything. They have they have systemized everything. Such that if they wanted to, they could make a robot that does all of them. I mean they could I'm sure actually probably sitting in a factory somewhere in, in you know, McDonald's headquarters behind the scenes. There's probably a machine that can do the entire thing. I'm, wouldn't surprise me one bit. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise um, me at all. And I've seen those, you've seen those videos like online where, you know, they do the whole thing and it's like, you know, is this going to revolutionize the entire industry or, or do this or do that? Um, right. But it's like, it's interesting to think that, you know, we have, we have some of the technology right now to make major changes in the way we, we interact with other people and, and with, with businesses and we're not, we're not there, right? We haven't, we haven't done that in so many ways. Um, and I'm just why? curious why, like why, I mean, like you said, you know, you're, the, the human dollar is, is cheaper than the robotic dollar, but you know, I almost feel like there's another part to that, right? It's like, what kind of backlash does a company like McDonald's get if they're like, listen, we're putting, you know, 4 million kiosks in our McDonald's and we're, you know, uh, taking away, I don't know how many jobs, right? Is it more a public, is it more a public image thing? Or is it actually something that's cheaper? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, did it, did the uh, manufacturing industry stop because of it? No, no, of course not. And, and even so, you know, like people say, oh, well, jobs are going to be, you know, lost, right? Sure. Like low, the low paying part of that job is lost, but with that comes more technicians for the robots, right? You get more people no. getting educated for that kind of stuff. Right. I don't, I don't know if there's really a job loss per se. I think there's a, a low income job loss, but I think it creates higher paying jobs, but, and, but and not, nearly, not what, but not nearly as many. Right, yeah, because one, one technician can service, you know, 25 would, McDonald's. Would, Anthony, they wouldn't invest in the robots if it didn't make sense to save money and cut jobs by saving money. Right. They wouldn't just swap – they wouldn't pay a whole bunch of money to swap in robots. And you, then don't think would say, you don't think long-term that saves a ton of money? I feel like it's got to. I, I feel like – you know, I don't but, know what the average lifespan would be for one of these kiosks, but I would just, feel like right. it. Just think about it economically, okay? You pay a bunch of money up front to build robots. Right. The robots come in and replace all the lower uh, income jobs. If you replace those with jobs that are the same number of jobs, but higher income jobs, why would you have paid for the hardware to begin with? Right, but that doesn't. What I'm saying is, it doesn't necessarily mean that McDonald's or, or and we keep using the McDonald's example, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't having a major cost savings, right? They're, they're like you said, they're going to pay up front for all these all these kiosks, right? There's no but difference. Maybe, you, still, you think that you, you might, think the the I, difference is going to be minimal? The the difference is, I don't. I think. With a, a service industry like McDonald's, it's a little bit different because the jobs that they might be removing are the ones that are right in front of people. Right. Um, if you look at how, say, the supermarkets did it, um, they came in and they took out part of the aisles and moved in, you know, partly self-service items, right. um, you know, because they were getting pushback about reducing jobs and that sort of stuff. But if you think about it, they still moved ahead with it. They still took the PR hit to save right. the money long term. Right. And they save a lot of money long term. Um, uh -huh. But I don't know if – I don't know if it necessarily would have the same effect as, as you know, and again, I don't know how many jobs are in in the McDonald's or in, you know, or no, if we took all the fast food. I don't know how many jobs there would actually be lost, but I'm, I would assume it would be millions, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs. Um so I almost wonder, you know, I almost wonder, is it more of a PR problem versus it being, you know, a, versus being a, you know, uh, something they don't want to do just because it's not going to save them a couple bucks. But anyway, all right. So let's let's get off the McDonald's yeah, topic for a second. Yeah. When, just before that, yeah. what I mean by that is when, when I say the money, the human robots versus the um, machine robots. I'm talking about it's cheaper right now to keep the humans on than to pay for the robots, pay for the upkeep, and pay for right. the PR hit. 
Do you, you think that changes? Absolutely. There go, there's going to come a time when these first two amounts get so low that they offset the PR hit against the amount of money that they're going right. to save. Right. And it becomes go, such a drastic savings. It's crazy. Right. They might be like, all right, we'll, you know, we'll take a, a $100 million PR hit, but we're going to save $200 million by implementing this, these systems. So net, net a hundred million. Right. Peace out. <laughs> yeah. Right. We'll live. <laughs> right. We'll live. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's it's sad to think that companies do that, but I mean, think about McDonald's in terms of the coffee, the whole like coffee incident where the woman oh, yeah. burned. Yeah, for the woman sued them. <laughs> no, but think about it. They had been they had been warned multiple times that their yep. coffee they were purposefully heating their coffee to make it too hot. The reason that they heated their coffee to be that hot was because it made it more aromatic in the stores. And they right. had all these tests that figured out that the smell of the coffee increased sales by whatever certain amount, <laughs> right? They took right. the PR and ended up paying the woman in settlement right. profits on one morning's, not even a day, one morning's run right. of coffee. Which is crazy. It was absolutely crazy. I mean, at the end of the day, she was happy. She was, you know, she, I don't know how hurt she got, but she definitely got paid. But yeah, you're right. It was such a minimal amount for them where it was worth keeping to do, like keeping on doing it long term. Um, right. Yeah, yeah they're crazy. willing, companies that are willing to take PR hits when they see the dollars behind it. Right. Especially or, that, that many dollars. You're not talking about, you know, an extra hundred grand over, over, you know, a certain amount of time. You're talking about, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Right. Yeah, Interesting. Exactly. All right. So let's let's get back to, to AI thing, though. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk more about AI and and machine learning and so you know you obviously know a little a little more about this you know especially in, in a deeper understanding of it. So I'll let yeah. you kind of run with this one and uh, I'll I'll chime in so, where I uh, where I know anything. <laughs> um, one we saw recently, actually, you and I talked about was it a week or two ago. Uh, was the artificial intelligence cars. Yeah. Um, with one of the new models that they're coming up with for these intelligent cars is that instead of uh, the two companies that are really going at it, you know, Google and um, uh, and Uber right now, or I think are really kind of the two leading the yep. way to some extent. But they're both having a bunch of programmers figure out the rules of the road and program this thing around the rules of the road. Um, right. There's a third group, and I'm trying to remember the name, but a third group came out and basically said, instead of doing that, we're going to try to teach the machine to learn driving habits from humans. Right. And like to, to use all of the patterns of the road to build up um, a system for how it drove and, and driving in the real world. And um, I think everybody, I mean, I did immediately, but I think everybody kind of hit the immediate point of, well, there's a, there's a flaw in that. I mean, do you, do you see the flaw? Uh, yeah. Most people don't know how to drive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, um, I think a lot of the whole machine learning thing is, well, what, what are we teaching it to learn? You know, what is its goal and what, you know, how is it learning? Um, what is it learning? How is it teaching itself? And right. like anything, like any of us, uh, in terms of education, um, we really can only make decisions based on the data that's input. Right. Right. And, and how we're taught to learn. Um, even if how you're taught to learn is a, is fantastic, but you feed it the wrong data, uh, right. I think that's. Um, well, that's apparent with uh, what was Microsoft? What was the teenage girl? I have no idea. On Twitter. Oh my God! Yeah, I, heard, I know you what you're talking about. about. Um, oh my God! And they didn't do like they would just say like repeat me, and these people were going nuts. Oh uh, yeah, that was that was a mess for them. <laughs> Nightmare. All right, oh, so for the folks, one uh, Microsoft, and and I can look, do you mind looking it up, Mike? 
Yeah, exactly what I'm doing. Weird. I can't wait for this new computer. Or not new, but this. <laughs> tomorrow, so, mother comes in tomorrow. To show you how uh -oh. funny this is, I just want a Microsoft Twitter, right, and then bot. And then the, <laughs> the results there are bot Nazi, bot Zoe, bot Reddit, bot fail. Like, <laughs> it was called um, Tay. <laughs> Tay. Tay is what it was. So Microsoft came up with, uh, used their, their systems for artificial intelligence to create a bot for Twitter um, that would, it was to mimic a teenage girl. Is that what they tried to do? Uh, yeah, it was. So it, the description of it from TechCrunch is they shut it down because of its inability to recognize and it's making offensive or racist comments. Uh, it was originally designed as, a, that's a whole thing here. Yeah, but basically what it was, it was set up to um, create tweets, respond to people, uh, right. Do all of these different things. That... And what was it using? It was using Watson, right? Wasn't it using the Watson platform because it had such deep understanding of everything and it was just a mess? I don't remember if it was Watson. All I know is that a bunch of internet trolls were able to end up feeding a whole bunch of terrible information <laughs> to this bot. Here's a direct quote but... from this article. As Twitter users quickly came to understand... Tay would often repeat back racist tweets with her own commentary. <laughs> 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 like, so here's an example of one. It's this guy, it's, I, I don't want to read his username, but it says, at Tay and you, are you racist? And the response was, back to the person, because you're Mexican. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> oh, wow. Man. And so, there's uh, there's example after example. Oh my God, these are ridiculous. Microsoft had a bit of a PR nightmare with this, um, but I think we can clearly see where AI is not quite ready yet. Uh, if you're just sort of unleashing it to the general world, um, you know, it's it's very much it's it's very much ready for very sort of closed scenarios and situations right very um, very controlled where you you basically almost especially at this point or the way i feel about it is you almost have to have every real world example of what someone can ask or what somebody can think of um and it has to be programmed in manually for the most part right um and and that's you know again when when i did my bot that's what i had to do i came up with customer service questions i came up with all this stuff and it you know when people ask stuff that's not there, if it's a if it's something that I'll see again and again, I will go in and I will add it for people to be able to ask that question and get the right answer again. Um, the problem there is now you're back to the point where it's you're programming a machine. That's not right. AI. It's not machine learning anymore. Right. Um, because you can't, you know, you can't have that situation happen. Right. So when? So wh how do? How does deep learning take off? Like how does? And I've, I've read articles about deep learning where some of like the top scientists on deep learning don't even necessarily understand like every detail about how it happens. So like, how is it, how does it even really work? Um, so uh, it's kind of where I started, which was saying that you're not teaching a machine something, you're teaching a machine how to learn something. Right. And then make decisions about what it learned. And, you know, if we really want to get into the depths of artificial intelligence, I mean, we could be here for you know, help people have <laughs> their PhDs in it and still don't quite really understand it. It's, it's you know, we, we really haven't broken that barrier yet. Right. Um, but that being said, we're at this point where um, the machines are starting to do better than the humans in certain scenarios. Okay. Where they are learning. And what I mean by that is, so Watson, you gave Watson as an example before. Right. A lot of people don't know what Watson is. Watson is uh, IBM's take on artificial intelligence and what they've been trying to build into artificial intelligence. And one of the early reports I saw about Watson um, was this thing where uh, they, they deployed Watson in hospitals. And... Hmm. They hooked it up to all sorts of scanners, but like very basic. We're not talking like MRIs kind of stuff. Right. We're talking like takes a picture of you, scans your eyes, um, you know, weight, blood pressure, like what you would do from a doctor for like a normal checkup, like in a okay. doctor's office. 
basically are able to give it that much data. And the cool part is the way they figured it out, you basically like walked in the room and it, fig it did like all that data almost interesting for you. Interesting. And then they would do a cross test where that same um, that same person would also go and be seen by the doctor. And they would both do a diagnosis. Right. Well, uh, Watson beat the doctors. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so there were there were a number of cases where they disagreed where Watson and the doctor disagrees, disagreed on a diagnosis. And right. in all of those situations, because this is like, that's how this was, the experiment was set up, is that they would then continue on with the doctor's recommendation because, you know, you're not immediately getting a doctor, jump. right. Right. Um, but in those cases where they disagreed, it was uh, on almost all of them found out like two, three months later that Watson was actually right on like, you know, They'd end up doing an MRI or they'd end up doing other more expensive tests. And, um, you know, because let's, I mean, think about it this way, right? A doctor with their capabilities is going and just, you know, without like taking pictures and analyzing and so on, a doctor can look at you and say, your eyes are dilated. Right. Right. Or your skin looks yellow. Or, like, they can do those sorts of things. But Watson can say how dilated your eyes are and down to the, you know, micrometer kind of a thing. Right. And then use that and use that data and other things against, um, you know, other data it understands and knows how that data relates to one another and all that sort of stuff. Right. Which, and plus it almost so puts the computer at a huge advantage because – it's got access to everything that's ever been printed about medicine, and it could run through that relatively quickly, where if a doctor doesn't necessarily know something specific, which is why they have regular doctors, they have specialists, they have this and that, right? So, but Watson could essentially look at it and say, well, I have all the data, and based on right. that data, this is the recommendation for it. And still, as a person, I would probably still oh. go see that specialist anyway. Um, sure. But it's interesting to think that the amount of information that they were able that Watson was able to look over and make a make a diagnosis is pretty amazing. And this goes back to the whole um, data concept in terms of you know how the the result of it greatly depends on um, the data that you feed in originally. Okay, and right. what I mean by that is like you just mentioned, oh, Watson has access to you know all of the world's medical um, documentation right. in terms of like books and white papers and, and all journals that stuff, right? and yeah, everything. Yeah. What if Watson also had, and, and as part of this study, they were able to start collecting some of this data. But what if Watson had pictures and end results, diagnosis, confirmed diagnosis tests, not attached to somebody's name per mm -hmm. se, but just like, skin tone hue or eye dilation or whatever, you know, things that you're talking about like that. Right. And the eventual diagnosis. Hmm. Then it starts running all of that data against the data you just presented to it. And all of a sudden, it's not just about what the doctors sort of are thinking it is in. And this is where the whole machine learning thing takes over is that it's not now the doctors saying that this person is statistically highly likely to have this because this, of the things right. they learned in school. It's this person is likely to have this because we just matched it up and they matched the symptoms to 98% of the other people that had this. Hmm. That's a much different diagnosis. Yeah, that's not only much different, but it becomes exponentially more accurate too. Right. So exactly. like I had, I had years ago, I was, um, I had back pain that I was, I was must've been eight years ago now, 23, 24. Um, so about eight years ago. Um, I had this back pain that I could not, I couldn't get rid of and Tylenol Advil went to doctor after doctor. And, uh, after nine months, it took me being with my dad in the airport for him to look at my foot and be like, Oh, you have gout. And I was like, what? 
<laughs> and literally I went to a rheumatologist, they confirmed it, and boom, haven't haven't had any issues with my back or any pain in my knee or anything like that since, right? But it's kind of amazing to think that that happens to so many people, right? Like how many people go doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor trying to figure out what's wrong and they just, they don't know, right? They, yeah. they go, oh, well, it could be this or it could be that. Let's try treating it this way. Let's try treating it that way. Um, really interesting to think that this kind of machine can help doctors and it's not a replacement for doctors, right? It's something where now if the doctor knows, okay, this is most likely what it is, here's the best case scenario of a treatment, and, and they put the doctor's touch on it, right? And okay. it's amazing to think what kind of power that has in the medical community. And that's it's a great example for, for machine learning. Um, right. Crazy. Well, imagine, imagine, um, imagine if doctors could focus on bedside manner. Right. Right. right, that's it. And they don't have to worry about am I wrong, am I right? Is it's like, right? It, it's not hours looking at MRIs or hours looking at CAT scans or whatever. Right. It's it becomes almost more of a service industry to some extent than it is a scientific side of things because a lot so of that me, starts getting by machines. So let me ask you this: obviously, the technology is there for something like that, right? Like why? What's the hesitation for the medical field to do it? Is it the fact that in order to really track that, you basically have to associate each case and everything with maybe not someone, but with some sort of identifying factor? Like what's what's the holdup for people? Well, up until, what was it, three, four years ago, the only secure way, secure way to send <laughs> medical records in the United States was via fax. <sighs> Doesn't surprise so, me. So um, <laughs> I don't. I really don't know. I mean, again, I think part of it's politics, part of it's money. Um, you know, you're disrupting something like that would truly disrupt the entire medical profession, right? <laughs> Plus, you have all the oh, concerns of like medical records, right? How much how much data can Watson really be? Like, can it really access? And, and are, how are we okay with that? Like, I think we have a lot of like privacy and security concerns that people have got to get through right. before we can do that. What is I think, it? Honestly, I, I think the holdup with AI and machine learning in general has a lot more to do with those sorts of things where we really haven't made decisions about what we want it to do, um, the levels we want to take it to, what sort of data we really want to share with it, you know? Right. Because, because again, like, you know, didn't we talk about the thing in Austin, Texas, with the rolling brownouts? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we right? talked about that so, a while ago, yeah. A while ago, a few episodes ago, we talked about this thing where there are rolling brownouts through Texas um, because uh, of the power grid in Austin. Uh, they were able to implement Nest thermostats throughout the city and turn mm -hmm. down people, um, uh, basically turned down people's temperature by one degree and by turning it down one degree they stopped all these rolling brownouts but what if they only had 10 percent of the city's data right well, like you know what if that same machine gets turned on and now all of a sudden you know we it, it only has a small bit and then it starts making decisions based on 10 percent of the data right that becomes a nightmare. I mean, that becomes a really bad situation. Yeah, that becomes a huge nightmare. Without all of the information available, it's a real problem. And you said they, they implemented that across the entire city of Austin, like so everybody had an S thermostat. It was like that crazy. It wasn't everybody, but what they did is the city subsidized it. So gotcha. you basically get a free Nest thermostat if you gave them access to be able to do this thing. Interesting. Um, Interesting. And I, I think I think my thermostat has that too because I got I, I didn't know it at the time. I have the Sensi thermostat, and um, mm -hmm. you know it's one of those smart thermostats. But when I got it, I got an email from PSEG that said, "Oh, you have a you have a Sensi thermostat. We'll give you an eighty dollar credit on your next bill exactly. if you fill out this form." I was like, "Done." <laughs> you know, Done. I spent like ninety five yeah. bucks on that thing. I was like, "Great, fifteen bucks." I got uh, the thermostat. Um, and I don't care if they want to put the degree up or down. Knock yourself out. That's cool. <laughs> right, right. And and you know, there's. I mean, you can think they're trying to do it for good reasons. I would hope right. they don't like jack by a temperature to raise their revenues. That could right. be kind of hysterical. I, I would but. probably be a, yeah, it would be a mess. But luckily, um, 
I don't know. You know what? Obviously, over the winter, I used heat, but it wasn't. We didn't have that crazy of a winter this year, so right. maybe I just got lucky with it. <laughs> well, and I, I think it's really only you know in dire situations those right. sort of things. I don't. They're just doing it willy nilly, but. Um, yeah, I think it's got to be, you know, only if they need it. And obviously, if they could stop a huge power outage by adjusting people's temperature a degree or even two, well, I'd much rather have power than be a degree cooler, you know, or, or warmer. Like, it's right. totally fine with me. Right. But you – now, that logic, you would think, would transition, right? <laughs> right. Right? I'd rather get actually diagnosed. Like, I'd rather have a better chance of getting diagnosed from Watson by giving up my metadata about, you know, about myself. Right. Not. But people won't do that. Because all of a sudden you yeah. come toward personal, you know, personal medical information and everybody gets really sensitive about it. Right. And I understand but, that. I understand um, it. Right. But there's got to be – it seems crazy, and uh, we talk about this all the time, like – how so much of this technology is out there. So there's so many things can be done and there's yep. just red tape around it. You know, it's, it's amazing where life could be for, for so many people if they allowed the tools that are built to be used. So you know? one of, one of the machine learning things I'm really excited about. Um, and this is going to, for most folks, you're going to look at this and be like, I don't care, but you will <laughs> This is one, going to be one of those things that, that ends up playing behind the scenes. Um, so I want to say it was Google, but um, a, a group built three um, AI robots based on the same – like they took one AI system and, okay. built, and built three robots. Okay. Two of the robots they tasked with communicating securely – with one another. The oh, I've seen robot, this. The third robot, they said, hack the communication between these two robots. Mm -hmm. And they let them war. I mean, they let them just battle and go <laughs> to war with, with one another um, of trying to figure it out. And it's, it's, there's this very interesting uh, curve as to how they sort of battle because they like battle, 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 battle for a little bit. And then all of a sudden it's like, Boop, Google figured it out, and the the chart drops off entirely, and all the communications going forward are secure, and this other robot just can't figure out how to get in. Now, the crazy part about that is neither can humans. Right. Like, humans can't even go back and figure out what the AI robots did to secure it, because if they could, then they could break it and figure out a machine to figure right. out how to break it. Um, <laughs> So we might actually end up with truly secure communications that, and, and, you know, for all of you folks that are going to say, well, VPNs and all of that sort of stuff, it really doesn't matter. Um, at the core of the internet, at the core of our whole infrastructure, uh, there is, there are some things that make just generally uh, communications insecure. So, right. My guess is that one of the early, at really, you know, applications of it um, is going to be artificial intelligence around security and around sending information. You think that's early. that's really where it starts, and then they realize how powerful it is, or everybody realizes how powerful it is, oh. and no, then it I, just drops industry into industry. I think it already started, and I think where it really started was, um, uh, I mean, Tony Stark had it right. I hate to say it. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I think it was – I don't remember which one it was. One of the Iron Mans, but he, he makes a comment about how um, Jarvis started as a natural um, language processor. Right. Alexa, Google Home, you know, voice recognition, voice search. I think that's really the core of where it all started was, okay. was natural processing, um, and I think a lot of it's going to end up growing out of that. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I love, I love my Alexa. I have one in every room, and um, not that it's overly powerful by any means, but the nominal tasks that I use it for are fantastic. You know, setting the timers, setting alarms, turning my lights on and off, turning the thermostat up or down or off. Um, 
it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, my mom actually makes fun of me because I'll be on the phone with her sometimes, and um, I don't have a, a light switch in my in my bedroom. That it's like you know one of those. It's a lamp, and it's on the other side of the room, but the switch doesn't work with it. So I'll be on the phone with her sometimes, and I'll be like, Alexa, turn the bedroom lights on. Alexa, stop. <laughs> she said, okay. um, "So I'll say it, and <laughs> she'll like laugh at me. She'll be like, you're so lazy.' I'm like, no. I'm like, I don't have a switch. This is how I happen to do it. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's hysterical, uh, but it's like I've had it for. I don't know when I got my first Alexa. I must have been last last year at some point, and I don't know when it was. Probably the beginning of the summer, maybe a little earlier than that. But it's." It's amazing. It's really, really cool to be able to just voice what you want, and the natural language process has gotten so good. Like once in a while, she uh, she messes up, but uh, for the most part, you know, it's it really is pretty fantastic. And you have the you have the Google Home, you said, right? Well, yeah, but but the difference is, see, I wouldn't necessarily call. I wouldn't. Way it's AI, call, right? Well, sort of, right? So. I wouldn't necessarily call Alexa a true natural natural language processing. And what I mean by that is the big, big difference between – there are a couple differences between Google Home and Alexa. Um, right now, Alexa is hooked into a lot more things, as you know. Right. But Google Home does a better job, much, much better job of stringing conversations together. Yeah, Alexa so doesn't I, string any conversations together. You show you show me on yours and, and on that video too. You sent me once. Um, it's I can't do that. I one string at a time. Right, exactly. And so what we mean, folks. Sorry, is, I'm yeah, not sure. Hey, I said her name again, and she got mad. <laughs> um, for folks, what he's saying is he says something like, you know, Alexa, do this, and then uh, like Alexa, how far is the moon? And Alexa will give him an answer. And then they'll say, Alexa, who was the first person on the moon? Right? With Google Home, you'd say, how far is the moon? And it would tell you. And then you'd say, who was the first person there? Right. Not on the moon, the first person there. And it will tell right. you. And you'll say, well, who is his wife? And it will tell you. When was he right. born? And it will tell you. That's where it becomes natural language, where you're starting to hold a conversation um, referencing things you had talked about before and actually right. have an entire conversation. I think that's a bit of a difference between the two. Um, and I think long term, probably Google, because of that, has a little bit of an edge if Alexa right. doesn't just pop onto that. But maybe they will. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I want to say they will. Um, but – I don't know. I don't know if they ever will. Um, and I'm not buying new ones until they break. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that. Do, what do you say? Do they run? Do they do they run over the air updates? I thought they did. Yeah, I think they do. Um, but I still don't think. I don't think it'd be in Amazon's best interest to just throw me an over the air update like that. I think it would be in there, but oh, it's Alexa version 4.0, right? Like that's where because if they did that that might get me to actually go buy it, right? Because I'm like, oh, well, I have the old one. I got to get the new one. But so I wouldn't just go out and buy a Google Chrome. So what you're telling me is that Amazon should pull an Apple. Right. That's exactly right. We're going to give you the same phone <laughs> six months apart, and we're going to change the chip name from seven to eight. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. <laughs> and we're going to tell you it's different and sell it to you for, for a right. more Okay. Right. All right. I like it. I don't. Um, you know, it's funny. I, Amazon has made a habit of um, of that move. Haven't they? It? Yeah, they did it with uh, the Echo Dots actually, um, and it was interesting. So they came out with. Okay. I have one version of the original Echo Dot in my bedroom, and then when I moved to my new place, I bought one for my kitchen as well, and that is the newer version of it. Mm -hmm. The old version was. It, it literally was just a mini, the mini big uh, Alexa, right? The Echo, it's called. Uh, the, the the Echo is probably about you know this this high. Oh, I know that. My table, you know, and the dot is you know this big. So they changed like everything about it. Instead of having a turning top, it's got buttons on top now. It's a little quicker when you say its name, and there's just you know really random small subtleties. And it used to be I think 149, and then when they came out with the second version, they're like, oh, instead of 149, we'll just do it for 49. And it was like a month after I bought it. I was like, really? I was like, I don't, this is, this is not. Yeah, good. but hold on a second. 
let's back up there. They put out a better, whether it be slightly better or not, they put out a better device than what you had and charged less money for it. I wouldn't call that an Apple. Oh, no, so definitely not an Apple. Better. No, no, definitely but not an Apple. Apple would have been like, the old one was 149, Apple, this one's going to be 349. <laughs> right. Here's the same one. You can pay me for the privilege of saying right. you have an like, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the only reason why I was actually upset about it is because I was part of their beta program. So I was one yeah. of the very early adopters of it. And, the whole, and I was like, really, guys? I'm like, this is, this is crap. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is really crap, guys. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, you know. But, uh, all right. So it is, uh, it's 7.20. Um, I got a Ranger game in 10 minutes. Um, it was a good, good talk today. So anybody, everybody who's watching, um, again, a few housekeeping items for the end. Um, we did, uh, did launch a couple of things. Podcast is coming out. Hopefully it'll be approved by Apple in the next week or so. Uh, new website is up and live. It's, uh, liveafterhours.com. Very simple, quick links to our Facebook live, our SoundCloud, our YouTube page. Um, business page is up and running as well. Um, Facebook.com forward slash live after hours. Uh, please like the page. We're going to be going live from there from now on. We'll be sharing it on our personal pages as well, but uh, everything is going to start there. So if you haven't already liked it, uh, please like our page. And um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Yeah, sign up uh, sign up for your emails for updates next time. And Ah, uh, yes. Yes, uh, forgot the email. <laughs> email. Sign, sign them up. We'll send you notices, let you know when we're going live. Let you know when we are live uh, and, and maybe email you every now and again uh, with some other cool stuff. So uh, giveaways and things like that we're going to be doing. Um, oh, last thing before we go. So last week I promised we were going to be giving away a couple copies of Seth Price, Price's book, The Road to Recognition. Um, they are on back order on Amazon. But this week, maybe let's say Thursday. So what we'll do is next week on Tuesday or Wednesday, we'll, we'll give a couple giveaways away. Um, all we ask is that you come, you watch, you comment, um, and share this or share the live video over the next couple of days, um, you know, on your page or on your uh, personal wall. Um, I have uh, five copies of the book coming, so I'll be giving away at least five copies of that book. Awesome. Well, this has been uh, Alex Camilio, uh, CEO of Agent Inner Circle. With me is Anthony Mann, founder of AM Open House. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us tonight, and. Uh, See you next time. Sounds good. Bye, guys.